welcome back uh, to the second part on stigma. This time I am titled it Stigma and Disability. What can we learn? Yes, what can we learn? Well, disability brings special knowledge about stigma because we, uh, you may recall social model of disability uh, in the previous discussion. One, one said in that model or approach to disability that impairment that is uh, blindness, deafness and, and so on becomes disability when attributed or given or called, called in with a, in some kind of discrimination. Discrimination makes impairment disability. Well, uh, some parts of it is true, but in many senses disability can provoke all the three other things that I was talking about, fear, uh, affective component, stereotyping, cognitive and some kind of social control. Why? Because physical difference, cognitive difference, emotional variation can invoke people's sense of anxiety. It may, for example, bring them to terms with their own mortality, their own limitation. Have you seen people running away from cancer patients? Uh, I have seen umpty number of rituals. Uh, I've been in a ritual setting, and one guy uh, who was doing the ritual said, uh, "My presence may be amangalam, means it is not auspicious blindness." You, you can't see, therefore you can't have light and there is no light, there is darkness and darkness is certainly a mangalam, it's not auspicious mangalam. That kind of reactions, disability, primarily disability alone can invoke. This this interesting concept you may like to ponder about. It is called aesthetic nervousness by Atto Quason. Aesthetic nervousness, what is it? Well, aesthetics is the study of or a field dealing with emotions and preferences and tastes. For example, I like Carnatic music, you may like pop or I like Hindustani and you may like Bollywood and vice versa. And depending on our mood, age, orientation, preferences, tastes differ. What Atto question here trying to say is aesthetic nervousness can be driven that is some kind of instability, some kind of negative attitude, withdrawal, disgust, fear and even withdrawal can be invoked by disability. There was a person who said, um, watching wheelchair dances, yes, there are uh, people on wheelchairs perform dance. Um, it's a dance performance on wheels, uh, as it were. And he said, well, cognitively I can appreciate, that is, I can analyze and appreciate 
but I can never enjoy this. I did not confront him, but I understood the meaning of aesthetic nervousness at that time. Meaning, a thing of beauty is a joy forever, they say. To him, person on wheelchair looked remarkable, an act of bravery, uh, act of vigor and maybe emancipation, everything, everything that has to do with achievement and pride, but never pleasure and enjoyment. Maybe he meant, uh, if you have a disability, waist low or up, you cannot be a fuller person. Therefore, a conversation with that person or a personal intimate enjoyment of any kind, say friendship, may be wrought with anxiety. This word adequation calls aesthetic nervousness. Well, um, forget about the concept for a second, aesthetic nervousness. We all have friendship or otherwise, even enmity, mostly it is based on our own, on our own projection, if you like. It may be true that the other person may be bad or so on, but the badness of the per other person is actually primarily is our own projection. Maybe we, once we meet a person, we associate that person with an uncle in the neighborhood who was bad to you, for example. Psychoanalysts or psychologists call this projection. Basically, you are attributing to the other person what you think he or she is. It is projecting. It is not there. And the second is projective identification. Means, you not only say that the other person is bad, you start identifying yourself with the other person as bad. So, that is when you feel disgust. Oh my God, when I am in the audience where wheelchair is perf in being performed in the front, I cannot enjoy this because it brings into sharp relief not only my bad projection, but I feel bad myself. So, this is why disability inclusion can happen as tokenism. What am I saying? On a table, there is a conference table and the conference organizer wants to feel good about himself or herself uh, by calling so that he or she can be called inclusive, they may invite a lower caste person, a disabled, a person from a different race and many other identities. That will not only advertise that the conference is inclusive, but it is also visible, you see that is not true inclusion. True inclusion is addressing the stigma about that cause discrimination in the first place, getting into the root of stigmatization. So, in other words, tokenism comes when stigma rules inclusion, oh yeah, include that guy because he is disabled, anyway we will get more funding. 
but uh, when you address aesthetic nervousness, stigma and other things about human difference, then you include that disabled person culturally, aesthetically and morally into one's uh, hold or conferences or anything or a public place and so on. This projection business uh, about disability and stigma is also very special. Um, I will give you an example. I used to use rickshaw some time ago to go to my office when, uh, when, uh, when I was in Delhi, I used to use rickshaw. The rickshaw wala one day said, uh, and I could understand some Hindi at the time, well, Saab, you know, only you can understand my problem. I do not think I can meet other passengers who can understand my problem. And he felt very good meeting me. Now, on hindsight, when I think about it, this rickshawala thought, yes, he may be looking rich or a middle class, but he has a disability. He must understand what it is to be stigmatized. Maybe he may understand what it is to be treated like a fly. After all, he is a rickshawala in Delhi. So, disability can invoke identification across marginal identities, a poor person, a leper, lesbian, a gay, people who are racialized and many other identities may feel, I am saying may, not all the time, not all the time, okay, may feel potentially connected if you like with uh, people with a disability. Well, now, what do we do from, what do we learn? I said, what can we learn? Disability can potentially say, stigmatization leads to some kind of master status. What is master status? Well, no matter your achievement, no matter your familial connection, no matter your service to humankind around you, your community and your roles, multiple roles, you may be at the end of the day called a Dalit or a disabled. Look at that. Stigma of a deviant kind, toxic kind, an unceasing flow of stigmatic attributes can reduce someone or affix someone to a master status. You are this, that is it, that is your master status. The rest is subsidiary, we do not care, but suit that rule, suit that role. Stigma can do, do that to people. And once that master status comes, people do not expect much from you. For example, uh, there are moments where people look at me strangely and look at, uh, uh, and many of my students have also reported about themselves. They look at them strangely uh, when they are in a place where they are not expected. For example, a woman would be looked at very strangely and she will feel the field of stigma around her when she is spotted in a military place. Hey, what are you doing here? You say. In Tamil, uh, there is a nice saying, 
இரும்பு அடிக்கிற இடத்துல ஈக்கு என்ன வேலை தட் இஸ் இன் அயன் ஸ்மித் ஸ்பிளேஸ் இன் ஸ்மிதரி வாட் கேன் அ ஃப்ளை டூ வை வை ஆர் யூ ஃப்ளை ஹே கமான் வை ஆர் யூ ஹியர் தெர் இஸ் ரோல் எக்ஸ்பெக்டேஷன் வில் பி ரெடியூஸ்ட் டு அ மினிமல் and one is that master master status will start ruling the roost basically one may be infantilized look like a child or oh, come on yeah and so on and and this is this can go on forever about people communities Ma- and other marginalized identities so you can expect a particular community to do one kind only one kind of a job maybe mending shoes or butchery and nothing more role expectation will be minimal how to handle part of my lesson about disability and stigma is also about how people handle this well talking about master status and infantilization and so on people with the disability and those who surround them are with them also face this problem families of people with the disability families who happen to meet and make people with a disability their family such as through marriages they can also potentially experience this stigma oh my god you got into this marriage why did you not get a better husband or a better wife why should you choose a disabled a disabled person that kind of stuff now uh, have we talked about master status and other things and uh, uh, across identity markers how do they handle it well work against stigma working against stigma may involve two three things one is rejection if the world rejects me i reject the world that's it people do that lots of uh, caste race politics uh, and much more is about that reject construct alternative knowledge and reject everything that's one modality the second modality involves well building positive attributes to oneself for example a disabled person may work incredibly hard to come up a a dalit person may work incredibly hard to have better professional mobility and so on third way of handling stigmatization to deny one's own capacity limitation or even one's identity in disability case one will pretend to be non disabled deny one's disability or deny any association with people with disabilities in cost studies this is called sanskritization pretend to be uh, uh, to be an upper caste and so on so uh, these responses um, as students of social sciences and humanities we need to be acutely aware so that we can start making sense of what we mean by stigma and so on. now let me 
Having flagged all these things, let me make a few concluding remarks. And my concluding remarks on disability uh, and stigma will involve the problem of disciplinarity. How can we think about stigma from our respective disciplines? After all, this course is about disability studies as a discipline. Well, I told you how stigma happens and how people come to terms with stigma. This can be a starting point about disciplines. For example, if we were a student of literature, then it would be such a joy to read autobiographies, fiction, poetry, cinema and so on for traces of patterns of stigma and how people with disabilities and other identities come to terms with their identity or comes to terms or fight stigma, fight back stigma. The other day one was talking about Michael Jackson, how he colored, uh, made himself so, uh, look like white because of uh, maybe the pressure of pop culture and two, pressure caused by or stigmatic attributions that he suffered because of his race and so on. So, um, literature, science, biology, social sciences, it is one can use frameworks such as discrimination, staring and gaze, emotions, emotional analysis, lot of lots of psychoanalysis can come handy in this regard. Maybe one can um, understand geography of stigmatization, how towns and communities are built based on stigma or rebuilt. A particular caste group may be jumbled into one place and, and the mainstream caste can be uh, expansively present. And this happens in all metropolis, London, New York, and so on and Chennai. So, there is this social geography of stigmatization um, and there is also traces of uh, literary and cultural representations. And finally, authentically scientific disciplines like medicine can st study stigma and how stigma can lead to depression, stigma uh, patients identify themselves to be stigmatized or non-stigmatized and why patients deny certain illnesses that they have. All this can be a huge opportunity for all of you and me to explore further. Thank you.